I make a lot of videos about woodworking on a budget, but woodworkers aren't just short on money, they're also short on time. I mean, how are you supposed to get a project done if you have two or three hours on the weekend to work on it? But what if it's even worse than that? I mean, what if you only have 15 minutes, 10 minutes every day to work on your woodworking? How are you gonna make progress in a situation like that? That must, it must seem impossible to new woodworkers. Hold on, let me do the alarm. Design. Okay, so I think though we can make a big impact on the lives of woodworkers even in 10 or 15 minutes a day. There's all sorts of things that you can do to improve your woodworking if you just change your viewpoint on the whole thing. Hold on, let me turn on the heat. I've got a bunch of strategies you can use even if you have almost no time at all. And I'm gonna share them with you as soon as the heat turns on. If you're trying to improve your woodworking and you've got 10, 15 minutes a day, you might have to stop thinking about projects. Instead, think about improving your woodworking. Luckily, there's a hugely underused resource right here in your shop. If you wanna get better at woodworking, you need to master the scrap bin. You might have heard stories about woodworking apprentices in the 17th and 18th century. And we all, we all assume that apprentices back in the day were kept busy all day long. Turns out that's not true. They had tasks for about half the day and the rest of the time they were supposed to occupy themselves. Doing what? Practicing. They were supposed to practice the skills they were learning on the shop's scrap bin. Now, we don't have a master standing over us telling us what to do, but we've got the scraps, we've got the tools, we can just do it ourselves. You've got just 10 minutes until your next Zoom call for work. What can you possibly do in 10 minutes? You can practice your cross cuts. Most of us get these cuts kind of ragged off the saw and then we waste time trimming. What you wanna do instead is get the most perfect cross cut you can, so hopefully it doesn't need any trimming. I like to use my saw bench for this because everything is integrated in the storage. I'm gonna draw myself a line across the face and then, this is really crucial, carry that line across the edge. You wanna saw on two lines at once. Check my stance before I start, get right on my line and let's go. It's no rush, so I'm being gentle letting the tool do the work. Watching both my lines as I go and blowing away that sawdust. Don't forget to control your off cut, that's really important. Good. Try square, have a look. Okay, this cut isn't bad, especially in through here, but right here, where I started the saw, it's a little bit high. It's not quite as square as it could be. So I'm gonna do this again and again if I need to. I've still got eight minutes until that Zoom call starts. Did you just get your first high-class joinery saw? Congratulations, that's a big step. Should you immediately dive into a project with a bunch of dovetails? You could, but I wouldn't. Instead, I would find a nice, clear scrap of pine and practice splitting some lines. You're gonna need a small square and a pencil. And we're gonna lay out a series of lines. These are rip cuts. Most joinery is rip cuts and they go with the grain. Now, just like those cross cuts, having two lines is crucial. And you need to lay them out so that they meet very precisely in the corner. Joinery cuts are more demanding than stock breakdown, and one of the things you're practicing here is precision in your layout. That's eight, and that's good for practice. I'm gonna use my finger to start my saw, start at the rear of my line, a little nibble to get started, and then draw that line across that end grain. Good, now I've got a good saw curve started. Let's get rid of that scrap, it doesn't matter. Now I wanna track down that line the best I can. Here we go.
Not bad. I basically erased my pencil line. I can still see a tiny bit on this side, so that probably means I left a little bit, kind of went off to the side a little bit right at the end. That's a pretty good cut. Let's try again. Stop and check your stance. Can your arms swing freely? Because that's really important when you're doing this. Also, are you using the whole saw? A lot of people just use the middle. Take the longest stroke you can and keep the wear on your teeth even. Not bad, probably better than my first one. Let's go again. That one got a little bit worse. I got a little bit impatient. Oh, and that's way worse. I'm totally off my line. That's okay. That's what practice is for. Here's a thing a lot of people don't understand about practicing. You won't necessarily be off in the beginning and then get better. You might get overconfident and then get off your line over here, which is exactly what happened. It's not linear. You don't get better as you go. You get better and you get worse and you refine your technique. And that's how you get better overall. When you're sifting through your scrap bin, looking for a piece to practice on, don't neglect small pieces like this. You might think, oh, I can't do anything with this, but this little scrap is perfect for miters. I'm gonna lay this miter out using my bench hooks because it keeps this scrap suspended up off the bench top. It's easier to handle. Get my line right where I want it and strike one half. Flip the square 90 degrees. Check it, make sure the lines are perfect, that they meet in a nice point. Strike the second part. That is a well laid out miter. For a little piece like this, you might need to be creative with the work holding. Don't fear the C-clamp, it works. You can see me sawing precisely here and blowing away the sawdust, really tracking that line. Here we go. Nobody's miters are perfect off the saw, and that's why we invented the miter shooting board. It's the perfect jig for cleaning these up and getting a perfect fit. Take half of your miter and put it against the fence. Slide it right up to the edge. Put your hand plane on the track. Feed the mitered piece in gently with your left hand while you plane. Excellent, set that piece aside. The other piece needs to go against the other fence. That's gonna give you that perfect 90, and we're gonna have to switch and pull the plane, but that's not a big deal. Once your miters come together like this, you're ready to make a picture frame or put a nice border around a box lid. There's a lot of nice details you can make once you can cut a clean miter. At some point in your woodworking career, you're going to get a fancy joinery plane, like a plow plane, a combination plane, or a moving filister plane, which is really just a fancy rabbit plane with a couple of extra features. Before you use a plane like this in a project, ask yourself, have I mastered this tool? Do I know how to do every single thing that it does? Because you can master a tool like this in like a week, in 10 or 15 minutes a day, there's only a few steps. First, you gotta get that iron razor sharp, just like one of your bench planes. Same thing with the knicker. Hone both of the bevels on a fine stone and then strop the back. You've gotta learn how to set the depth stop and the fence. I use a small combination square for both of these, but there's more than one way to do it. This one is a nice wooden example, which means you have to hammer adjust it, which is no big deal. If you want more iron, just hit the back of the iron, and if you wanna back it off, hit the strike button. It's really not difficult. Once you've done all of these things, you know how to set it up, and now we can learn to use it. To use the plane, the most important thing to know is that each of your hands has a separate function. Your right hand is only responsible for pushing forward. Your left hand shoves the plane in toward the work so the fence stays engaged. Set the plane on the work, make sure you're on the sole, not on the depth stop, that's a real easy mistake to make. Start at the far end, not near yourself. Push forward with your right hand, in with your left hand, begin with short strokes. 
Check and make sure you like the thickness of your shaving. I do. Continue to plane, moving backwards as you go. And when you reach depth, the plane just stops cutting like magic. There is a lovely rabbit. Once you've rabbited one piece of wood, go ahead and rabbit another one. Flip them over, put them together like this, and you've created shiplap, the poor man's tongue and groove. Congratulations, you just learned a new joint. Now I bet you've got a shooting board, maybe even a pretty fancy one, but do you really know how to use it? Do you just put a piece of wood right against the fence and blast off? Yeah, don't do that you're very likely to break out the grain over here. And even when you're shooting, it's really helpful to have some sort of reference line. That way, you know what you're shooting for, if you'll pardon the expression. I've drawn a line here very close to the end of my board, but it gives me something to know when I'm actually square. Flip your board over, put it at about a 45 degree angle, brace one corner up against the fence, and let the other corner hang just the tiniest bit over and give it a couple of strokes, nip that off. I'm gonna go a couple more. Perfect. It might not be easy to see on camera, but I've beveled that end grain right down to my layout line. Now the grain on the end is supported and it's impossible for me to break out. Let's shoot. I try to usually shoot until I get through about half of my layout line. You can see just a tiny bit of the pencil still there. I've got no breakout on that top corner and I know this end is square. No guesswork. As I was shooting this video, I had no idea how I was gonna end it. And now that we're at the end, I think we should cut a dovetail. Now, I don't cut a lot of dovetails because I'm not that good at it. Most of the projects I do on this channel, they just don't call for dovetails. Of course, the fact that I'm not that good at it kind of leads me to pick projects that don't need dovetails, which leads me to not practice, which keeps me from getting any better. So I think this is a good time for me to take my own medicine and cut a joint that I'm not that confident with. And it doesn't really take long to cut one dovetail. You could probably do it in like 20 minutes. Take a piece of stock that's already square-ish, cross cut it in half, shoot the ends, and you can dovetail those two pieces together really quickly. The tools are nothing crazy. Obviously, you need a dovetail saw, but other than that, it's you know a pair of chisels, a marking gauge, a good square. I have one of those dovetail angle gauges you get off Amazon, the aluminum ones. They're, they're cheap and they're fine, honestly. And throughout cutting this joint, I'm using the things we practiced in this video. I'm making sure my layout lines are really crisp and accurate. When I'm using my tools, I'm making sure to use them in smart ways that I've been drilling, so they're becoming second nature. When I cut with my dovetail saw, I take full strokes, use the whole plate. That keeps me from getting dull spots, my lines cut straighter, and I work more efficiently. The whole thing is, I mean, it's easier than I remember. I haven't cut a dovetail in months, but this was, it was pleasant. I had fun. I also didn't put on any music or a podcast or anything. I was working on this joint for about 20 minutes and I gave it my absolute full attention. An important thing if you're learning to cut dovetails is don't judge your joint by the dry fit. When you first put those two boards together, they might look eh, not great. Even if it's just for practice, carry that thing all the way through. Put glue on it, put it together, let it dry for a little while, plane everything flush. Your gauge lines and your pencil marks and all of that stuff, it makes the joint look worse than it is. And you know, mine wasn't perfect. I had to tuck a little shaving in there to close a tiny little gap. But I can live with that. It, it really doesn't bother me. And you know, the finished joint came out just fine. I mean, look, I'm. I'm not gonna put it on Instagram, but I also don't have to. It's not necessary to show off every little thing we do. This joint is fine, super strong. I would absolutely put it in a piece of furniture. Anyway, this video is about scraps. It's about using the scraps from your scrap bin, but it's also about those little scraps of time you have. 
It's a weird metaphor, but it works. In a busy day where you've got work and family and stuff with the kids and you're gonna cook dinner, you might only have 10 or 15 minutes. We often don't use that time, and there's a couple of reasons. One is that woodworkers are understandably obsessed with projects. We treat woodworking like it's a machine for making objects, and it is, but it's also a practice. It's like playing a musical instrument. Everything isn't a performance. You just pick up your instrument and fool around sometimes. You can go into the shop for 10 or 15 minutes and fool around. You can do nothing but make chips and shavings, and it's fine. You don't need a thing that you can show off. Another problem that we have is there are these videos that people make on YouTube that promise you're gonna do something perfect the first time. And I have to admit, I don't, I don't really agree with these videos. I've been doing this a long time, and I can't think of anything I ever did perfectly the first time. I think telling people that creates unreasonable expectations. You might follow a formula really precisely and get something right the first time ever, but there's probably a lot of dumb luck in that. And did you actually learn anything? I don't think so. I, I think we learn by making mistakes. It's a complete cliche, but it's also true. Incompetence is the path to mastery. So. The message of this video is if you have 10 or 15 minutes, go out in the shop and do something. Take a two by four and mortise and tenon that thing together. I promise it will put a smile on your face. It will be worth doing. Uh, throughout this video, I used a ton of shop-made jigs and fixtures and other helpers. I used my saw bench, my workbench. I had some other things like my miter shooting board. I don't make miters at all without this. I use it for all of them. We have plans for all of this stuff, and all of those plans are on sale right now. They are all half off. We rarely do sales. This is the only one we're going to do all year, and it's from now until Christmas. So. Don't wait, go on over to rexkruger.com slash store and get yourself a little something for the holiday. One problem with being a woodworker is that the people in our lives often don't know what to get us. So sometimes we have to fend for ourselves. Cheap way to do that is make some stuff for your own shop. Another good way to spend little bits of time here and there. Patreon.com slash rexkruger. If you'd like, you can get all of my plans for free. All of them. Patrons don't pay anything, and it's a big archive of plans. They also get an amazing community, a discussion forum, everything early. They get behind the scenes. It's a lot, and it's $5 a month, and it keeps this channel independent, which matters to me a great deal. Anyway, turn off YouTube. Turn off your computer. Go out in the shop for 10 minutes and mess around. Go play. It's okay, I give you permission. Thanks for watching.